Welcome to the Film Analysis, today with Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick. This film is probably the most underrated Kubrick, a masterpiece. Highly complex and at the same time very straightforward, containing splendid actors and telling us very much about sexuality without really explaining it. Rather, it explains above all the inexplicable. This film, which is uh, adaptation of Arthur Schnitzler's dream story represents today more than ever a political issue. It is important to proceed chrono chronologically to develop an educated understanding. It starts with this beautiful couple who at the time used to be a couple in real life as well, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise. He is a successful doctor and they are invited to a social event, an evening party. We experience the erotic social game. Nicole Kidman flirts with Sky Dumont while dancing. Meanwhile, Tom Cruise flirts with two young women. We experience a game of se the sexes. Everything is kept very conventional, but at the same time something very banal would be possible here. You could say, yes, let's have an open relationship, Nicole Kidman flirts with Guy Dumont and Tom Cruise with the two girls. It would all mean nothing. The film could now become a banal relationship issue. Kidman and Cruise as a couple, we are not endangered. But at the same time, the aspect of death is introduced. At least we see a harbinger, an essential actor who is to appear again at the end, Sidney Pollack. He represents an important personality in New York and has sex with a prostitute. She seems to die due to an overdose and Tom Cruise helps her out. Then we end up back home. There is a sex scene between Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, but only the beginning. It seems strange how Tom Cruise embraces Nicole Kidman int intimately and sinks into her. Kidman looks in the mirror contemplates the couple and contemplates herself. Cruz, it soon turns out, does not understand female desire. He has silly evolutionary explanations at the ready, says men are like this, women are like that. In fact, as we will see, there are differences, but they are much more complicated than Cruz's statements. It's more reminiscent of some Ying Yang, C.G. Jung or Jordan Peterson. But Stanley Kubrick is clearly Freudian in band. A narration by Nicole Kidman follows, telling a sexual fantasy. They were out of town and in a hotel when a naval officer showed up and a quick look he gave her, left her entranced. She would have been willing to sacrifice everything for one night with this man. Everything. Her husband, her daughter, her entire future. We should take this everything literally. It doesn't simply break with convention. She doesn't just state, I would have liked to have had an affair. After all, she could easily entertain affairs mingling in New York high society. Kubrick articulates at this point, sexuality contains a radical negation of the existing, a negation that can almost destroy oneself. Kidman's anecdote ends by saying that she got much better par with Tom Cruise afterwards. It was a love that was sad and tender. That is, love and sexuality are separated here as it's no longer sexualized. There is a phone call. Tom Cruise, as a doctor, learns of the death of a patient. Cruise gets into the car and drives off. Black and white images pop up in his imagination, depicting his wife sleeping with a naval officer, but there's nothing to see in those images. Cruz's imagination cannot grasp with Kidman described. What Kipton described, the underlying negation of this sexuality refuses any manifestation. Cruz now sets out to seek his sexual desire. We follow him on his pursuit throughout the film, but where may he succeed? 
he's searching for the intensity of Kidman's experience. The first stop leads Cruz to the dead patient, a not so pretty older version of Nicole Kidman named Marion appears. She is the daughter of the man who died. Only the death of the father now seems to allow her to desire. Marion tells Tom Cruise, I love you. Cruise can't understand that at all, says you and I don't even know each other. Kubrick spells out again what Kidman described. Now Cruise represents something like the naval officer. The daughter also knows at the same time about the great embarrassment inherent in the confession. She says, you must not despise me. Afterwards, Kubrick accomplishes something wonderful. He lets a version of Tom Cruise enter, the woman's husband, a not too attractive, slightly older Tom Cruise. We are back in the open. Tom Cruise is running through the streets and encounters a group of teenagers. This group is not coincidentally reminiscent of Alex and his rooks from A Clockwork Orange. Their insecure masculinity manifests itself as homophobia and homophobic attack patterns. Now there is the second attempt, Cruz meets a prostitute, a vulgar version of Nicole Kidman. Let's make ourselves comfortable, she suggests. Yes, he comes along to her place. She's living in rather poor conditions. Tom Cruise is in a foreign world, but he is not able to charge this foreign world with an exotic, erotic fantasy. He asks, what would you recommend to me? Which sexual services do you offer? And she answers very wisely, I don't want to put it into words very wisely, because the actual self-evident is unexpressible. You can't verbalize it because the sexual always eludes language. Language fails in depicting the sexual completely. Cruz, after receiving a call from his wife, cannot perform the act here. He takes refuge in a jazz bar, meets Nick Nightingale, a former fellow student who now cultivates an alternative lifestyle to Cruz as a musician. He has dropped out of medical school. They talk and Cruz learns of a strange orgy he would like to attend. Actually, he is not allowed to attend without a costume. Cruz now believes this strange so secret society orgy can really give him what he wants here he will find his desire and here he will be able to satisfy his desire. But first he goes on a long costume hunt, entertains lengthy dialogues with the costume store owner in the shabby surroundings of his store. Is Kubrick bored? Is he trying to annoy us? No. Kubrick underlines the ridiculous effort to satisfy our sexual desire. You can break it down to the tedious preparation for a date, getting ready, shaving, buying condoms. The pettiness of everyday life antagonizes the sexual. You check to see if the last subway is still running in case the date doesn't go as planned. It is precisely this pettiness of everyday life that Kubrick beautifully rolls out before us. He adds a third version of Kidman, a Lolita version. It's the underage daughter of the costume shop owner. But Cruz doesn't show interest in her either, perhaps because of moral considerations. He sets off to this secret place, to this monumental estate, the fourth stop. We experience an endless stream of women. Nightingale plays the organ blindfolded, which renders everything a bit banal. There is something ridiculous about playing around on an organ in this stately home. But at the same time, sex is performed as a quasi-religious ritual. Kubrick shows sex has little in common with fun, but there is a great seriousness in it. But what is to be shown there now, or rather, what does Tom Cruise see? He 
his looks tell, is that it? One involuntarily thinks of the sentence by Karl Kraus, coitus does not keep what onanism promises. Disappointment spreads also in us as spectators. We do not witness this fulminant orgy. The scene appears very aseptic. Why is Tom Cruise recognized as a foreigner? Well, he doesn't fit into the prevailing order. We experience the most subtle form of exclusion. It's all secret codes apparently signaling who belongs. We have perhaps all experienced it to a lesser extent in clubs or at uh, parties where lawlessness is supposed to exist. Rather clear cruel rules of the game prevail but unspoken. Who does not follow does not belong. After this traumatic event, at the orgy, a woman has sacrificed herself for Cruz so that he can leave there at all. Tom Cruise returns to his apartment. His wife tells him about an erotic dream. She wants to humiliate him. Once again, the naval officer has appeared and she has had sex with an infinite number of men. The dreamed seems much more intense here than what Cruz experienced. The next day, the search for desire continues. It's a diffuse story about Nightingale that Tom Cruise must first pursue. He ends up back at the costume shop and is expl explicitly offered the young daughter. After that, he returns to the office. The plot now becomes a bit more chaotic. It's no longer in order. The scenes have become as twisted as the chaotic nature of the sex. Tom Cruise is in his practice but returns to the estate during the daytime only to find the gate locked. In daylight the scene seems mundane. A strange old gentleman hands him a letter telling him never to come back. He goes back to Nicole Kidman. She is helping the daughter with homework. Now he doesn't get a typical male fantasy together. On the one hand he sees the mother here and on the other hand he is still quite aware of Kidman's confession the other night from the dream having apparently slept with an infinite number of men. Imagining his wife as a mother and as a sexual being is now suddenly infinitely difficult for him. He sets off again to the, to the office and he thinks about calling Marion, the older version of Kidman, who no longer mourns the father presumably. Now he could take care of her. He calls but the husband picks up the alter ego of Tom Cruise. The last attempt follows. Once again back to the prostitute but the prostitute isn't available. Only her friend, another prostitute. She tells him when they are getting closer that she must tell him something after all. Cruz appears to be successful. He might have found his sexual desire and is about to satisfy it. He even seems to be talking himself into it. We see Tom Cruise playing Tom Cruise once again as we know him from his other films. He's grinning, he's sitting, they are white legged. But the prostitute must admit something. She says, well, you meet my roommate yesterday. She got her blood test results today. She is HIV positive. Now the erotic body flips to the medical body, a major discourse in Ice White Shut, for example, whether Tom Cruise has a sexual desire towards his female patients when he feels her breasts and he denies that. I don't think he is lying to his wife. You can see here that it's just the HIV diagnosis accounting for the fact that now he can no longer perform the sex act. Cruise must leave again for a moment before then something happens.
Before the prostitute's confession, Tom Cruise could believe in his masculinity. Kubrick lays out something very astonishing here. The psychoanalyst Alenka Zupanschik sums it up splendidly. She says, femininity, that's a mask, but masculinity, that's a matter of faith. Something is always missing. You are never completely man or completely woman. As a woman, you endure femininity as a mask. As a man, you believe in being a man. Tom Cruise gets back on the street, but now Kubrick covers the street scene with what I would call delicate surrealism. Not quite reality, it is New York, but slightly displaced. One could easily imagine the scene morphing into an image by René Magritte or Salvador Dali. A strange man follows Cruz. The former could take part in a Magritte painting. What is haunting Cruz after all? A social prohibition, a convention that says you must not or is it something internal to sexuality itself that says you must not? All that remains open. Cruz now learns that the woman who sacrificed herself really died. He looks at the body in the hospital. Here he recognizes again only the medical, no longer the sexual body. Cruz seeks out Sidney Pollack again and has everything explained to him. Kubrick now unfolds a schematic, very poor crime plot. He clears it all up a bit. There is no mystery. Kubrick rather says, what you experienced last night and what you viewers experienced proves to be com completely banal. We catch ourselves thinking that if we could observe our own sex from the outside, it would seem very ordinary. One is almost willing to say with Alex, it is merely the old in, out, in, out. Yet it remains a mystery that Kubrick suddenly brings with full force to the film once again. Sex is not liberal. What does this mean? When Tom Cruise arrives back home and is in a kind of post-coital sadness, everything seems terse to him. He recognizes the mask from the orgy that he couldn't find a few scenes before on the pillow next to his wife. How did the mask get there? Kubrick, of course, does not explain. Everything previously experienced Pollock's explanation, everything is thus negated again. The mask symbolizes the crossing of the rational. Sexuality remains. Kubrick wants to tell us a great mystery. Eiswechat is a film about the complexity of desire and the impossibility of satisfying it completely. Something always disturbs us. And the worst thing is that we often don't even know exactly what we are supposed to desire. Today we often experience the discourse that one must articulate what one really wants, one must express one's needs. Of course, one may express certain wishes. I'd like to have a three or four some, but that doesn't cover it. Quite the opposite. Kubrick still provides political dynamite relevant today. Kubrick defends Freud's psychoanalysis and along with it sex as something that cannot be dissolved, cannot be fully explained, cannot be dissolved in liberalization and historicization. The novel by Schnitzler is from 1925, but it is set around 1900. N but not quite. The film relocates the original to the 90s. Is that even possible? Kubrick's co-screenwriter was horrified and said that gender relations had changed after all. Kubrick doubted this. This 
illustrates the prevailing discourse on sex today, which believes that we must overcome bourgeois moral concepts, that if we are open to everything, we will experience liberated sexuality. We are always dealing with historical constructs. If we recognize these as constructs, then we can free ourselves from them and really enjoy sexuality to the fullest. But this is contradicted by progressive psychoanalysis. For example, psychoanalyst Alenka Zupancic in her outstanding book What is Sex? She says there was, of course, the rejection of psychoanalysis by conservatives, by moralists who say we don't want to know all that like that. But uh, she says this form of resistance to psychoanalysis, indignant about its obsession with dirty stuff, was never the strongest and was very quickly marginalized by advancing moral liberalism. But much more disturbing is the thesis of the always problematic and ontologically uncertain character of sexuality itself. To the Victorians who cried, sex is dirty, Freud replied, not no, it is not dirty, it is only natural, but something like, what is the sex you are talking about here? End of quote. In fact, psychoanalysis can't resolve that at all. And that's what is really disturbing. Sure, we can articulate sexual practices all well and good, but the scandal of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis is that you can't just liberalize sexuality and you are liberated. At the same time, you can't say sex isn't that important either. Chupancic writes, both possibilities, namely the ones just described, leave no room for psychoanalysis, because psychoanalysis considers the impossibility of complete sexual satisfaction and in the absence of all external obstacles, a constitutive and integral part of unconscious sexuality as such." End of quote. Meaning, in the absence of external obstacles, that is where actually now the moral conventions already play no role, there lays precisely the impossibility of complete sexual satisfaction as a constitutive and integral part of unconscious sexuality as such. Kupik portrays this in Eyes Wide Shut, a truly gigantic undertaking, but one he succeeds in. It's ingenious to cast the film with Tom Cruise since others stage him as the guy who can have it all and he just doesn't get it here because he doesn't even know exactly what he wants. That's a brilliant idea, casting the dream couple from back in the day. The tabloids, of course, say, sure, that's really the fantasy when it becomes reality. How gigantic that must be, such a beautiful couple. Kubrick shows, even if you are Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, even if you are together, the big sexual problem remains unsolved. Finally, why the enigmatic title Eyes Wide Shut? Seeing and not seeing collide, reminiscent of sexuality, we close our eyes to really see the other or we look in the mirror like Nicole Kidman so that we must look at ourselves and not at the other. But doesn't this same eyes wide shut also apply to the cinema? We go to the cinema, close our eyes to the reality outside so that we can see it through the fiction on the screen so that we don't just watch but see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.